Genesis account of origins. <clears throat> that is the title of the third chapter in uh, both the Genesis creation account and its reverberations in the Old Testament. And he spoke, and it was divine creation in the Old Testament, which uh, are essentially the same book. There's the cover for the two books. Um, we're going to be looking at chapter 3, and actually it's a very dense chapter, and we're not going to get through it today. So this is part one of chapter 3. It's called The Genesis Account of Origins by Richard Davidson from Andrews University. And uh, in note one, it is noted that uh, this chapter was originally published in a slightly different form as the Biblical Account of Origins in the Journal of the Adventist Theological Society in 2003. And uh, it uses a New King James Version, which gets rid of the these and thous, but otherwise retains pretty much the same translation. Um, and the initial draft was actually given as a paper at the International Faith and Science Conference in Glacier View Ranch uh, in Colorado uh, in 2002. I was at that conference, but unfortunately was not able to listen to the presentation. But from what I understand, it carried the day because the major points that he is arguing about uh, were accepted as consensus points at that conference. And that includes people who have uh, had and still have a belief in a long ages for uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, or the uh, for life on Earth. <coughs> and uh, the chapter begins, Scholars have increasingly recognized that Genesis 1 through 3 is set apart from the rest of the Bible, constituting a kind of prologue or introduction. These opening chapters of scriptures are now widely re regarded as providing the paradigm for the rest of the Bible. John Rankin summarizes the growing conviction among biblical scholars. Whether one is evangelical or liberal, it is clear that Genesis 1 through 3 is the interpreter foundation of all scripture. I'm not going to read the whole thing, although uh, it's surprising how little I'm able to skip without uh, taking away material that I consider important. Um, in the beginning, this is the four parts of the chapter. We're going to get through in the beginning uh, part way. In the beginning, the when of origins, God, the who of origins, created the how of origins, the heavens and the earth, the what of origins. Bereshit Elohim bara. Actually, it's Bereshit bara Elohim. It's Hashemayim ve'et ha'aretz. The when, in the beginning. In discussing the when of creation, a number of questions arise for which an answer may be sought in the biblical text. Does Genesis 1 and 2 describe an absolute or relative beginning? Does the Genesis, that's question number one. Question number two, does the Genesis account um, intend to present a literal historical portrayal of origins or is some kind of non-literal interpretation implied in the text? And those are the two questions we'll get through today. Number three, which some of you will be interested, I'm sure, does the biblical text of Genesis 1 describe a single creation event encompassed within creation week or a two-stage creation with a prior creation described in Genesis 1-1 and some kind of interval implied between the description of Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-3 and following? Number four, does the Genesis account of origins present a recent beginning or at least, at least for the events described in Genesis 1-3 and following or... And that should be FF, and I missed catching that uh, misinterpretation by OCR. Including life on Earth, or does it allow for long ages since creation week? Those are the questions that uh, we'll be looking at. And we're going to consider each one of those questions in turn, although the last two we won't get to today. <clears throat> 
Number one, an absolute or a relative beginning. The answer to the question of an absolute versus a relative beginning in Genesis 1 depends to a large degree upon the translation of the first verse of the Bible, Genesis 1.1. There are two major translations, as an independent clause or as a dependent clause. As an independent clause, the standard interpretation until recently has been an independent clause. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That, of course, is the old king. According to the traditional interpretation, dominant until the triumph of historical criticism in the 19th century, this verse is taken as a main clause describing the first act of creation, with verse 2 depicting the conditions of the earth after its initial creation phase, and verses 3 through 31 describing the subsequent creative work of God. Such an interpretation implies that God existed before matter, and thus he created planet earth out of nothing or out of his word, if you, if you prefer, at an absolute beginning for creation. Now, a dependent clause in recent decades, some modern versions have translated Genesis 1-1 as a dependent clause following the par parallels in ancient Near Eastern creation stories. And this can happen in two ways. Number one, Genesis is taken as a temporal clause either subordinate to verse 2, such as in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, or sometimes when God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, or subordinate, making a really complicated sentence, to verse 3 with verse 2 as a parenthesis, describing the state of the earth when God began to create. When God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth being unformed and void, kind of like a little parenthesis and so forth, and darkness. And then God said. So those are the two options. In either case, only verse 3 describes the actual commencement of the work of creation. When God began to create, the earth already existed in the, in the state described in Genesis 1-2. For either subordinate clause, uh, clause alternative, Genesis 1 does not address the absolute creation of planet Earth, and thus the end result is the same. It gives a relative beginning to creation, allows for the possibility for pre-existing matter before God's creative work described in Genesis 1, and thus allows for God and matter to be seen as co-eternal principles. I find it fascinating that we're going in this direction in... Uh, describing what's happening when in science we're going in precisely the opposite direction, that there was in fact a beginning and it was a beginning not only of matter but also of time and space. Moving on, um, the, uh, if you have the independent clause, you have creatio ex nihilo, or creation out of nothing, is explicitly affirmed, whereas in the dependent clause it's not mentioned. Now it's interesting, with the dependent clause you could still have creation out of nothing, it just doesn't say it for sure. And God exists before matter, matter is already existed when God began to create, although he could have created it at some earlier time. Um, so that, but that God could be seen as co-eternal. God created the heavens, the earth, the darkness, the deep, and water versus the heavens, the earth, darkness, deep, and water were already existing when God began to create. Um, and in, in the independent clause, you have an absolute beginning of time for the cosmos. And in a dependent clause, no absolute beginning is indicated. Now, why people would want to fight this, I don't know, because science seems to indicate that at least for our universe, you don't include whatever multiverses are out there. For our universe, the one we know about, it had a beginning and virtually nobody is arguing about that now. Victor Hamilton in his commentary on Genesis summarizes the importance of the proper translation of the opening verse of scripture. The issue between these two options, in the beginning when and in the beginning, is not esoteric quibbling or an exercise in micrometry. The larger concern is this, does Genesis 1-1 teach an absolute beginning of creation as a direct act of God, or does it affirm the existence of matter before the creation of the heaven and earth? To put the, creation, uh, put the question differently, does Genesis 1-1 suggest that in the beginning there was one, God, or does it suggest that in the beginning there were two, 
God and pre-existent chaos. The modern impetus for shifting from independent to dependent clause, translation of Genesis 1, is, well, at least openly largely based on ancient Near Eastern parallel creation stories, which start with the dependent clause. But ancient Near Eastern parallels cannot be the norm for interpreting scripture. And furthermore, it is now widely recognized that Genesis 1, 1 through 3 does not constitute a close parallel with the ancient Near Eastern creation stories. That is, they seem to be different and deliberately so, and probably theologically so. For example, no ancient Mesopotamian creation stories start with a word like beginning. Already, with Hermann Gunkel, the father of form criticism, we have the affirmation. This is a guy who doesn't believe the Bible, but he tries to read it as he can understand it. The cosmogonies of other people contain no word which would come close to the first word of the Bible. As will be discussed below, numerous other differences between the biblical and extra-biblical ancient Near Eastern creation stories, and in chapter 1, by the way, um, revealed that far from borrowing from the ancient Near East, the biblical writer was engaged in a strong polemic against the ancient Near Eastern view of origins. Now, I have to be really careful about that because I think that's a slight exaggeration. I think the polemic is built in, but it is not overt, and it may very well have been built in maybe knowing that there would be other stories, but, but not explicitly reacting to them. Biblical e evidence for the dependent clause interpretation is likewise equivocal. The alleged parallel with the introductory dependent clause of the Genesis 2 creation account is not as strong as claimed since Genesis 2b, 2, 4b through 7, like the ancient Mesopotamian stories, has no word like beginning that Genesis 1, 1 has, and there are other major differences in terminology and syntax as well as literary and theological function. The expression Bereshit elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible, all in Jeremiah, is indeed in the construct. But as discussed below, these construct occurrences are consistently followed by an absolute noun in the beginning of the rain. If you take Hebrew, you recognize that the way they did of, it was plastered onto the first word rather than the second word, although singular masculine nouns didn't usually change at all. You just had to know because they were in the right position. But in any case, it's not followed by an absolute noun. So you can't have a beginning of as expected in construct chains, whereas Genesis 1 is unique in being followed by a finite verb, which is not the normal syntax for a construct form. Furthermore, as noted be below, the use of merishit, or from the beginning, without the article, but clearly in the absolute, in Isaiah 46.10, shows that Bereshit does not need the article to be in the absolute. Now, let me, that's a little inside uh, baseball or inside Hebrew. And uh, is if, if it were the article, it would be Bereshit. Interestingly enough, you can't tell the difference from the Hebrew consonants. All you can tell is that, uh, that when they put the vowels in, um, probably 1,500 years ago or so, uh, that they thought that it didn't need, in Hebrew, the article ha. Um, but merishit is a, is a different animal, and that one actually should be meharishit, if it needed the article. And obviously it doesn't need the article. That would have shown on the, uh, uh, in the consonants. And so you can have in Hebrew from the beginning without, in English, without having to put the article in, in Hebrew. Evidence for the independent clause, evidence for the traditional view, the independent clause is weighty and persuasive. For example, 
although the Hebrew word Bereshit, or in the beginning, does not have the article and thus could theoretically be translated as a construct in the beginning of, the standard way for expressing the construct of genitive relationship in Hebrew is for the word and construct to be followed by an absolute noun. Very much like we might say the, the, the mother's love. Mother is kind of in construct in, he, in English that way. <clears throat> in harmony with this normal function of Hebrew grammar, Elsewhere in scriptures where the word bereshit occurs as a construct in a dependent clause, it is always followed by an absolute noun. So, yeah, it's what you expect. With what it is in construct, not a finite verb as in Genesis 1.1. Furthermore, in Hebrew grammar, there is regularly no article with temporal words such as beginning when linked with a preposition. And the bereshit is a good example. Thus, in the beginning is a natural reading of this phrase. Isaiah 46.10 provides a precise parallel to Genesis 1.1. The term Mereshit, or from the beginning, without the article, is clearly in the absolute and not in the construct. Grammatically, therefore, the natural reading of Genesis 1.1 is in an independent clause. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, instead of in the beginning of, of what? Syntactic, syntactically, Umberto Casuto points out that if Genesis 1-1 were a dependent clause, the Hebrew of Genesis 1-2 would have normally either omitted the verb altogether, which it has, or placed the verb before the subject, which would be the normal while consecutive construction. The syntactical construction that begins with Genesis 2, with while plus a noun, Aretz, and the earth, indicates that in verse 2 begins a new subject, and therefore that the first verse is an independent sentence and not a dependent clause. Short stylistic structure of Genesis 1. The, the traditional translation is an independent clause conforms to the pattern by, of brief terse sentences throughout the first chapter of the Bible. As Herschel Shanks remarks, why adopt a translation that has been aptly described as a verzweifelt geschmacklos? Let's say, uh, pardon my German, a hopelessly tasteless construction, one which destroys a sublime opening to the world's greatest book. In other words, you have all this other stuff and it just really fits well, beautiful writing, and then you start it out with a dependent clause which makes a big, long sentence, complicated sentence, difficult to understand sentence. It doesn't make sense. Theological thrust. Now, this is one place that I would probably um, uh, change slightly. The account of creation throughout Genesis 1 emphasizes the absolute transcendence of God over matter. This chapter describes one who is above and beyond his creation, implying creation ex nilho, and thus the independent clause. Of course, I agree with that, but the argument from the other side is going to be precisely that why they want it as a dependent clause is so they can avoid the theological thrust or say it isn't actually there. So that's one of those where it depends on your starting point where your ending point is going to be. Ancient versions and other ancient witnesses. All the ancient versions, uh, for example, Septuagint, Vulgate, Symmachus, Aquila, Theodosian, Targum, Onkelos, the Samaritan Transliter Transliteration, Syriac, Vulgate, the whole works, renders Genesis 1-1 as an independent clause, as does the English, for, for that matter, the Old English. This reading is followed by ancient witnesses such as Joseph Theophilus, Josephus Theophilus of Antioch and Pseudo-Justin. And it's parallel with John 1, 1 through 3. The prologue of the Gospel of John is clearly alluding to Genesis 1, 1 and commences with the same phrase that begins Genesis 1, 1 in the Septuagint. In John 1, 1, as in the LXX, the phrase is in the beginning, in RK. Without the article, interestingly, it has no article, but is unmistakably part of an independent clause. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, uh, if you read that 
can you possibly translate that as in the beginning of whatever was the word? It's an absolute. In summary, I find the weight of evidence within the scripture decisive in pointing toward the traditional translation of Genesis 1.1 as an independent clause. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Here in the opening verse of the Bible, we have a distancing from the cosmology of the ancient Near East. If you like, you could call that a polemic, although I think it's a pre-polemic. Um, an emphasis upon an absolute beginning and implication of creatio ex nihilo in contrast to the ancient Near Eastern encyclical view of reality and the concept that matter is eternal, which, by the way, was popular until the Big Bang Theory came and kind of ruined that. Now, the next question is, is this literal or non-literal? The question of literal or non-literal interpretation of the creation account in Genesis 1-2 is of major importance both for, the biblical theo both for biblical theology and for contemporary concerns about origins. Many, including the critical scholar Hermann Gunkel at the turn of the 20th century, have recognized the intertextual linkage in scripture between the opening chapters of the Old Testament and the closing chapters of the New Testament. This is kind of an interesting argument. In the overall canonical flow of scriptures, because of the inextricable connection between protology, the first things, and eschatology, the last things, Revelation 20 through 22, without a literal beginning, protology, there is no literal end, eschatology. So if there's going to be a literal end, you really need a literal beginning. Furthermore, it may be argued that the doctrines of humanity, sin, salvation, judgment, Sabbath, and so on, presented already in the opening chapters of Genesis, all hinge upon a literal interpretation of origins. That's a good argument for Adventists, um, not so much for people who are kind of on the fence because maybe they don't want a literal end and therefore the idea of a non-literal beginning might be attractive. <clears throat> non-literal interpretations, here's some reviews of them. Scholars who hold a non-literal interpretation of Genesis approach the issue in different ways. Some see Genesis 1 as mythology based on ancient Near Eastern parallels as already noted. Building upon ancient Near Eastern parallels, John Walton has recently advanced the theory of cosmic temple inauguration. Uh, Warren knows a little bit about that. According to Walton's interpretation, the Genesis account describes a seven-day inauguration of the cosmic temple, setting up its functions for the benefit of humanity, with God dwelling in relationship with his creatures. Even though Walton regards the days of creation as six literal days, for him the creation is only functional creation, I don't know, I would say it's only non-functional creation because it doesn't actually do anything. It's symbolic, strictly. But anyway, he calls it functional creation. In other words, assigning functions to the cosmic temple. He argues that, like the ancient Near Eastern creation accounts, Genesis 1 says nothing about material creation and no passage in Scripture is concerned about the age of the earth. Thus, following Walton, we are free to accept theistic evolution as a means for God's material creation of the cosmos. Among evangelicals, a still popular interpretation of Genesis is the literary framework hypothesis, which maintains the Bible's use of seven-day week in its narrative of the creation as a literary or theological framework and is not intended to indicate the chronology or duration of the acts of creation. Other evangelical scholars contend that Genesis 1 and 2 is essentially theology and thus not to be taken literally, although how that follows, I'm not sure. A related view argues that the Genesis creation texts are essentially liturgy or worship. So, for example, Fritz Guy states, Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3 is, first of all, an expression of praise, an act of worship, necessarily formulated in the language and conception of its time and place. Once the text is deeply experienced as worship, its transposition into a literal narrative Conveying scientifically relevant information seems not only a misunderstanding, but a distortion, trivialization, and abuse of the text. I'm not sure the original people would say that. Another popular interpretation involves day-age symbolism. There are several day-age theories. First, a common evangelical symbolic view, sometimes called the broad concordance theory, Concordus theory, is that the seven days represent seven long ages, thus allowing for theistic evolution, also called evolutionary creation. 
Although sometimes evolution is denied in favor of multiple step-by-step -step divine creation acts throughout the long ages, which makes it a little more sense to call it evolutionary creation in that situation. I think that Hugh Ross would fall in the latter category. Another theory, the progressive creationist view, regards the six days as literal days, each of which open up a new creative period of indeterminate length. So, they're days, but they're followed by millions of years. Still another theory, espoused particularly by uh, Gerald Schrader, uh, attempts to uh, harmonize the six 24-hour days of creation week with the billions of years for the universe, as estimated by modern physicists, by positing the idea of cosmic time. God's time is seven days, our time is billions of years. The effect of all these day-age views is to have six days represent much longer periods of time for creation. And if you're suspecting there's a pressure, he will deal with that, and yes, it is, there is. Um, <clears throat> several evangelical scholars speak of the Genesis account of creation week in terms of analogical or anthropomorphic days. The days are God's work days. Their length is neither specified nor important, and not everything in the account needs to be taken as historically sequential. Still other scholars see the Genesis creation accounts as poetry, metaphor, parable, or vision. Common to all these non-literal views is the assumption that the Genesis account of origins is not a literal, straightforward historical account of material creation. Now, evidence for a literal interpretation, this of course is not scientific, it's, it's uh, uh, biblical, theological, however you want to call it. Is there evidence within the text of Genesis itself and elsewhere in Scripture that would indicate whether or not the creation account was intended to be taken as literal? Indeed, there are several lines of evidence. One, literary genre. The literary genre of Genesis 1 through 11 points to the literal and historical nature of the creation account. Kenneth Matthews shows how the suggestion of a parable genre, an illustration drawn from everyday experience, does not fit the contents of Genesis 1, nor, the vision, nor does the vision genre, since it does not contain the typical preamble and other elements that accompany biblical visions. Stephen Boyd has conducted a statistical analysis of Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3. That, by the way, is in the second rate book, interestingly, showing that this material is not intended to be read as poetry or extended poetic metaphor, but co constitutes the narrative genre of a literal historical account. Likewise, Daniel Badaiko has applied text linguistic principles of discourse typology to Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3, demonstrating from its formal characteristics that this passage constitutes a historical narrative text type. Likewise, the penetrating critique of, uh, critique of the framework hypothesis conducted by Robert McCabe has concluded that the framework view poses more exegetical and theological difficulties than it solves, and that the traditional literal reading provides the most consistent interpretation of the exegetical details associated with the context of the early chapters of Genesis. Terence Freetheim, although himself suggesting a liturgical order for what origin for what he considers the pre-canonical Genesis 1 material, in other words, he has this pre-Genesis 1 before Genesis 1, and that's kind of liturgical, acknowledges that the narrative as it now stands in Genesis 1 has been freed from these cultic and liturgical settings, and its present context is to be interpreted literally as describing the temporal order of creation. That is, he has this theory for which there's little evidence, but he acknowledges that once you get done with all of that stuff, what we have now is intended to be literal. Walter Kaiser has surveyed and found wanting the evidence for placing these opening chapters of Genesis 1 in the mythological literary genre, and he shows how the best genre designation is historical narrative prose. More recently, John Salehammer has come to the same conclusion, pointing out that the major differences between the style of ancient Near East myths and the biblical creation story narratives of Genesis 1 and 2, prominent among which is that the ancient Near Eastern myths were all written in poetry while the biblical creation stories are not poetry but prose, which is one of the points that, for example, Stephen Boyd was making. Furthermore, Salehammer argues that the narratives of Genesis 1 and 2 lack any clues that they are to be taken as some kind of non-literal, symbolic, or metaphorical, meta-historical narrative as some recent evangelicals have maintained. 
Salehammer acknowledges that the creation narratives are different from la later biblical narratives, but this is not because of, but this is because of their subject matter, creation, and not their literary form, which is narrative. He suggests that perhaps we should call Genesis 1 and 2 a mega-history to describe literally and realistically aspects of our world known only to its creator. <coughs> In fact, I would personally say that uh, Genesis 1 was probably written by God himself, or at least given to Moses, uh, to given to Adam and written down later. As mega-history, that first week was a real and literal week, one like we ourselves experience every seven days. But that first week was not like any other week. God did an extraordinary work in that week, causing its events to transcend by far anything which has occurred since. And that's why you could say God rested even though he does still work. Literary structure. The literary structure of Genesis as a whole indicates the intended literal nature of the creation narratives. It is widely recognized that the whole book of Genesis is structured using the word generations. It, that's the King James translation. Toledot. Uh, in connection with each section of the book. It's in there 13 times. This is a word used in the setting of genealogies concerned with the accurate accounts of time and history. It means literally begettings or bringings forth from the verb yalad, uh, meaning to bring forth or beget, and implies the genesis of the history of beginnings. The use of toledoth in Genesis 2, 4 shows that the narrator intends the account of creation to be just as literal as the rest of the Genesis narratives. And I forgot to change the, uh, put in the reference there. Um, as Matthews put it, uh, and what, uh, before we read Matthews, I'm going to note that what it means is that the story of Abraham, the story of Isaac, the story of Jacob, were intended to be a piece with the story of creation in terms of how, you, how they were to be read. The return, to get back to Matthews, the recurring formulaic Toledoth device shows that the composition was arranged to join the historical moorings of Israel with the beginnings of the cosmos. In this way, the composition forms an Adam, Noah, Abraham continuum that loops the patriarchal promissory blessings with the God of the cosmos and all of human history. The text does not welcome a different reading for Genesis 1 through 11 as myth versus the patriarchal narratives. Of course, there are some people who claim the patriarchal narratives are myth too. But you have to realize, once you start going down that road, how far down you're going to have to go. Later in this commentary, Matthews insightfully points out how the Toledot structure of Genesis precludes taking the Genesis account as only theological and not historical. If we interpret early Genesis as theological parable or story, we have a theology of creation that is grounded neither in history nor the cosmos. The Toledoth structure of Genesis requires us to read chapter 1 as relating real events that are presupposed by later Israel. If taken as theological story alone, the interpreter is at odds with the historical intentionality of Genesis. The writer intended it to be historical. For critical scholars who reject the historical reliability of all or most of Genesis, this literary device will only illuminate the intention of the final editor of Genesis without any compelling force for their own belief system. But for those who claim to believe in the historicity of the patriarchal narratives, the Toledoth structure of Genesis, including its appearance six times within the first 11 chapters of Genesis, is a powerful internal testimony within the book itself that the account of origins is to be accepted as literally historical like the rest of the book. It meant what it said, you can disagree with it if you want, but if you're going to believe that the Bible is the word of God, then you're kind of stuck with the literal historical interpretation. Specific temporal terms. Other internal evidence within Genesis that the creation account is to be taken literally and not figuratively or as symbolic of seven long ages, conforming to the evolutionary model as suggested by some scholars, involves the use of specific temporal terms. The phrase evening and morning appearing at the conclusion of each of the six days of creation 
is used by the author to clearly define the nature of the days of creation as literally 24-hour days. The references to evening and morning together outside of the Genesis 1 invariably, without exception in the Old Testament, 57 times in total, 19 times with yom or day, and 38 times without yom, indicates a literal solar day. Again, the occurrences of yom or day at the conclusion of each of the six days of creation in Genesis 1 are all connected with a numeric adjective, one day. Actually, to be precise, it is one day, it's not first day. Uh, second day, third day, and so on. Any comparison to uh, with the occurrence of the term elsewhere in Scripture reveals that such uses always refers to literal days. Furthermore, references to the function of the sun and the moon for signs, seasons, days, and years indicates literal time, not symbolic time. Unless you want to make the sun and moon symbolic, I guess. Uh, biblical references outside of Genesis 1 and 2, intertextual references to the creation account elsewhere in Scripture, confirm that the biblical writers understood the days of six days of creation to be taken as six literal, historical, contiguous, creative, natural 24-hour days. If the six days of creation were to be taken as symbolic of long ages, as six visionary days of revelation, or only as analogical days, or anything less than the six days of a literal week, then the reference to creation in the fourth commandment of Exodus 20, 8 through 11, uh, commemorating a literal Sabbath, would make no sense. The Sabbath commandment explicitly equates the day, six days of humanity's work followed by the seventh day Sabbath within the six days of God's creation followed, pardon me, yeah, with the six days of God's creation week followed by the Sabbath. By equating humanity's six day work week with God's six day work week at creation, and further equating the Sabbath to be kept by humankind, each worth with the first Sabbath after creation week, uh, blessed and sanctified, God, the divine lawgiver, unequivocally interprets the first day a week as a literal week, consisting of seven consecutive, contiguous 24-hour days. That's, of course, a famous argument. Uh, interestingly enough, if you make the fourth commandment disappear, you still have most of the argument because uh, later in Exodus, that same point is repeated. Biblical references outside of Genesis 1 and 2. Intertextual references to the creation account elsewhere in Scripture confirm that the biblical writers understood that six days of creation to be taken as li six literal, historical, contiguous, contiguous creative, natural 24-hour days. If the six days of creation week were to be taken as symbolic of long ages, as six visionary days of revelation, only as analogical days, or anything less than the six days of a literal week, then the reference to creation in the fourth commandment would make no sense. And to go on beyond that, uh, we're going to be covering some of those in other chapters, so I'm not going to continue the detail there. As a broader intertextual evidence for the literal nature of creation accounts, as well as the historicity of the other accounts of Genesis 1 through 11, it is important to point out that Jesus and all New Testament writers refer to Genesis 1 through 11 with the underlying assumption that it is literal, reliable history. Every chapter of Genesis 1 through 11 is referred to somewhere in the New Testament, and Jesus himself refers to Genesis 1 through 7. In penetrating articles, Gerhard Hazel, Terence Freitham, uh, Fretheim, and James Stambaugh, among others, set forth in detail various lines of evidence, including evidence not mentioned here for lack of space, based on comparative, literary, linguistic, intertextual, and other considerations, which lead me to the inescapable conclusion set forth by Hazel that the designation Yom in Genesis 1 means consistently a literal, natural day of approximately 24 hours. The author of Genesis 1 could not have produced more comprehensive and all-inclusive ways to express the idea of a literal day than the one chosen. With Stambaugh, I conclude that according to the biblical evidence, God created in a series of six consecu consecutive, approximately 24-hour days. Were they exactly 24 hours? Well, to the millisecond, maybe not. Maybe the Earth's rotation is speeded up or slowed down a little bit. But they were evening, morning days, at least. While the non-literary when the non-literal interpretations of biblical origins must be rejected in what they deny, namely the literal historical nature of the Genesis account, 
Nevertheless, many of them have an element of truth in what they affirm. Genesis 1 and 2 are concerned with mythology, not to affirm a mythological interpretation, but as a polemic against ancient Near Eastern mythology. Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 4 is structured in a literary symmetrical form. However, the synthetic parallelism involved in the sequence, I don't know how that, that got chopped off, um, in, of the days of Genesis 1 is not a literary artifice created by the human writer, but is explicitly described as part of the successive creative acts of God himself, who, as the master designer, created aesthetically. See the discussion below in section 4, focusing on the how of creation, which we'll get to later. The divine artistry of creation within the structure of space and time does not negate the historicity of the creation narrative. If God did it artistically, it's not fair for us to say, well, then it must not have been literal. Genesis 1 and 2 do, not, uh, do provide a profound theology. Doctrines of God, creation, humanity, Sabbath, and so on. Uh, and I think that's a reference probably to 70, uh, 60, 84 or something like that. But theology in scripture is not opposed to history. To the contrary, biblical theology is always rooted in history. The Exodus happened, therefore it means something, and therefore we have a right to take that theological meaning. If the Exodus didn't happen, then do we even have the right to take that meaning? There is no criterion within the creation accounts of Genesis 1 and 2 that allows one to separate between cosmogony and cosmology, as some have claimed, in order to reject the details of a literal six-day creation while retaining the theological truth that the world depends upon God. And if that's all you wanted to say, couldn't we have said it a lot faster than the whole six chapters, or six day creation thing? Likewise, there's profound symbolism as well in sanctuary temple imagery in Genesis 1. For example, the language describing the Garden of Eden and the occupation of Adam and Eve clearly allude to the sanctuary image and imagery and work of the priests and Levites, who are perhaps supposed to recreate that. Um, thus, is, uh, and I, again, I missed a reference there. This is get, getting late at night when I was doing this. Uh, thus, the sanctuary of Eden is a symbol, or better, a type, of the heavenly sanctuary. Um, but because it points beyond itself, does not detract from its own literal reality. Presuppositions and the witnesses of, witness of biblical scholars, and I think this is a really important part of what he has to say. Some biblical scholars who reject a literal six-day creation week frankly admit that their ultimate criterion for such rejection is not on the level of foundational, uh, pardon me, is on the level of foundational presuppositions in which the sole scripture principle is no longer maintained. In other words, they don't believe the Bible, and so if it runs into difficulty with science, they just throw it to the winds. Uh, more precisely, they try to reinterpret it because because if you just throw it to the winds, then you look like you don't believe the Bible, and we don't want to do that. Rather, some other authority or methodology, be it science, ancient Near Eastern materials, historical critical principles, mythological doubt, causal continuum, rule of analogy, and so on, have been accepted in the place of sola scriptura principle. This is true both of liberal, critical, and conservative evangelical scholars. They believe it because they want to. For example, evangelical scholars Carl Giberson, er, Giberson, I'm not sure, and Francis Collins acknowledge the great weight of the so-called assured results of science with result to origins in their interpretation of Genesis 1 and 2. We do not believe that God would provide two contradictory revelations. God's revelation in nature studied by science should agree with God's revelation in scripture studied by theology. Since the revelation from science is so crystal clear about the age of the earth, we believe we should think twice before embracing an approach to the Bible that contradicts this revelation. That's where you start. And you're going to wind up in that general direction. Two other evangelical scholars, Richard Carlson and Tremper, Tremper Longman, freely acknowledge their pre-understanding regarding the relationship between science and theology. We believe contemporary science addresses the questions on how physical and biological processes began and continue to develop, while theology and philosophy answered why for these same questions. What's not mentioned in this is 
You can't ask why until you ask whether. And if how interferes with whether, then how is going to interfere with why. And they're not neatly separable. To cite another example, Walton presupposes that in order to understand biblical culture, including the biblical view of creation, the key then is to be found in the literature of the rest, for the rest of the ancient world. But of this, of course, assumes that the rest of the ancient world fits smoothly into the biblical record. Based on the pre supposed non-material functional creation described in ancient Near Eastern literature, well, Walton finds the same in Genesis 1 and 2 and thus is free to accept Theistic evolution is taught by science, since the Bible does not speak of material creation, at least in his view. You, uh, forget the university, yeah, that's one I missed. Uh, building upon the foundational insights of Langdon Gilkey's seminal essay and Fernando Canali's research, uh, Tiago Arias analyzes other examples where cosmological premises are brought into the interpretation of Genesis 1 through methodological assumptions. The presence of non-biblical macro-hermeneutical presuppositions in the interpretation of Genesis 1 is, unfortunately, too seldom acknowledged, or apparently even consciously recognized, at least stated. And again, I missed that word. I find it fascinating, yes, ironic, to note that liberal critical scholars who frankly acknowledge their historical critical presuppositions who do not take the authority of the earlier chapters of Genesis seriously, and thus who have nothing to lose with regard to their personal faith and the relationship between faith and science, have almost universally acknowledged that the intent of the Genesis 1 writer was to indicate a week of six literal days. Against those who would contend that the writers, or writers of the early chapters of Genesis are not intending literal history, and that this is the view of the great majority of contemporary scriptural scholars, the Concordist, Alvin Platinga, you may know him as a philosopher, collects samples of these statements. For example, Julius Wellhausen, a giant in critical biblical scholarship, popularizer of the documentary hypothesis for the Pentateuch, wrote concerning the writer of Genesis. He undoubtedly wants to depict faithfully the factual course of events in the coming to be of the world. He wants to give a cosmogonic theory. Anyone who denies this is confusing the value of the story for us with the intention of the author. Great point. Again, Gunkel, father of quorum criticism, says people should never have denied that Genesis 1 wants to recount how the coming of the be of the world actually happened. You can disagree on whether they're right or not, but that is clearly what they meant. Platinga also cites James Barr, whom he describes as Regis Professor of Hebrew at the University of Oxford until he joined the brain drain to the U.S. and an Old Testament scholar, than whom there is no more distinguished. How's that for a complicated sentence? Barr writes, to take a well-known instance, most conservative evangelical opinion today does not pursue a literal interpretation of the creation story in Genesis. A literal interpretation would hold that the world was created in six days, these days being the first of the series which we still experience as days and nights. Then after substantiating that evangelical scholars do not generally hold that literal interpretation of the creation account, Barr continues, in fact, the only natural exegesis is a literal one, in the sense that this is what the author meant. And that's a reference that I, again, neglected to change. Elsewhere, Barr goes even further. So far as I know, there is no professor of, old, of Hebrew or Old Testament at any world-class university who does not believe that the writer or writers of Genesis 1.11 intended to convey to their readings, readers the ideas that A, Creation took place in a series of six days, which were the same as the days of 24 hours, which we now experience. B, the figures contained in the Genesis genealogists provide by simple addition a chronology from the beginning of the world up to the later stages of the biblical history. And C, Noah's flood was understood to be worldwide and to have extinguished all human and land animal life except for those in the ark. Well, maybe except for some of the frogs. I don't know. Another giant in Old Testament scholarship not cited by Platinga is Gerhard von Rath, probably the 
foremost Old Testament theologian of the 20th century, and another critical scholar who refuses to accept Genesis 1 as factual, that yet nonetheless honestly confesses what is said here, speaking of Genesis 1, is intended to hold true entirely and exactly as it stands. Everything that is said here is to be accepted exactly as is written. Nothing is to be interpreted symbolically or metaphorically. How's that for a categorical denial? Von Rod is even more specific regarding the literal creation week. The seven days are unquestionably to be understood as actual days and as a unique, unrepeatable lapse of time in the world. We could add to this list of critical scholars the preponderance of major interpreters of Genesis down through the history of the Christian church. Notice there's a reference for that. And in modern times, whole coves or phalanxes, to use Platinga's expression, of conservative evangelical scholars who support a literal six-day creation as the intention of the narrator of Genesis 1. It's a lot easier to just believe that the text meant what it said. Based upon my personal study, this is uh, Davidson, of the Genesis account of creation, Genesis 1 to 2, and later intertextual allusions to this account, I must join the host of scholars, ancient and modern and both critical and evangelical, who affirm that Genesis 1 and 2 teach a literal material creation week consisting of six historical, contiguous, creative, natural 24-hour days, followed immediately by a literal 24-hour seventh day during which God rested, blessed, and sanctified the Sabbath as a memorial of creation. But this leads us to our next point concerning whether all of creation described in Genesis 1 and 2 is confined to that literal creation week or whether there is a creation prior to the creation week. And we will get into that next week. Now, my take, I have to agree with Dr. Davidson. I think Genesis 1 read in its most natural meaning, implies a beginning to time, space, and matter. That's its first point. And secondly, the near universal interpretation of those who are closest in time to the writing of Genesis was that the days were intended to be taken as literal. The exceptions to the ancient history, especially Augustine, appear to be philosophically driven, number one, and number two, wrong in their interpretation. Not just by conservatives, but by liberals as well. Nobody thinks Augustine is really right. Dr. Davidson writes densely. It is difficult to find dead wood or filler in his writing, although I think I may have repeated one uh, slide. He <clears throat> does not deal with the scientific objections to a literal six-day creation, but then he doesn't claim to do so. That's not his job either in his paper or here, that will have to be left for another time. Right now it is sufficient to note that by far the more natural reading of the text is as history and as implying a beginning and six literal contiguous 24 more or less hour days. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Comment here and then up there. Go ahead. Uh, very good presentation. I uh, tend to agree with all of it, uh, like you do. Uh, I wished, perhaps, that, uh, and this may come later in the book, I don't know. He does refer to the Ten Commandments, Exodus. Uh, that he might have emphasized, and this is my personal opinion, that probably the most authoritative words we have in the Bible are not Genesis. They're when words that are dictated by God, written by his finger, spoken by him at Sinai. Written twice. Yeah. Uh, that state that, you know... Uh, keep my Sabbath because I created in six days. Uh, this, this, you know, is, puts those words almost in a different category than the rest of the Bible uh, because this is God speaking. This is God writing. 
and uh, not subject to all kinds of other interpretations if you respect God. So, uh, in that one, in that context, I think we can state we, uh, it's pretty hard to say that uh, Genesis 1 to 11, as it commonly say, you know, is, is allegorical, the rest is historical. It's interesting that the Creation Research Society has, as, it's, as it says, Haik uh, Credimus, this we believe. Uh, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Uh, and and it, that is not a, an exclusively Adventist organization, although there were Adventists at its forming. Go ahead. Um, there was passing reference of the similarity between the sanctuary and the Garden of Eden. Can you elaborate on that? Um, well, actually, there's a couple of videos that if you go back far enough, you can listen to Warren Johns elaborating on that. Uh, um, there, what, about five years ago now or something like that? About five years. Uh, um, what were they entitled? And then they, you can look it up. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. You're correct. Uh, yeah, temple theology is something that Adventist scholars are very recently looking at. Dr. Davidson and I have collaborated and shared research. He's now found over 25 references, indirect, mostly indirect references, in the in the account of the garden that bring in temple theology. It's a little bit harder to see temple theology in Genesis 1, though. And some, like Jacques Ducan, say, well, we don't really see it. It's a stretch of the argument. But Davidson now sees it in Genesis 1. So I was going to do my dissertation on temple theology, but I was directed elsewhere. Uh, and it's good because a lot of new things have come out since I was there back in the 1980s. So, well, I want to hear from everyone else and not from myself. <laughs> a couple comments up here. I got a little comment about looking at the Ten Commandments as being such a clapped down truth. Um, if you, if you notice, the Ten Commandments is actually written down two places in the Bible. Each, each one, each place as it's written, it's exactly the same, except for the Fourth Commandment. Now, the Fourth Commandment in Exodus talks about creation, but the one in Deuteronomy talks about being set free from the Egyptians. So it looks like whatever the fourth commandment is talking about is talking about it through applications. It's not really being talked about because of creation. The other point I want to make is that we believe God was around before creation. And that you've got ten commandments that are supposed to be the character of God. So if you have the fourth commandment talking about creation, that means part of God's character wasn't around before the earth was created. A um, couple of comments on that. <laughs> Number one, we've actually had a Sabbath school on that. Will the real Ten Commandments please stand up? And I can assure you that, in fact, those two accounts are not exactly identical. Okay, so which in one would it be? or in Hebrew. Which one would it be then? If they're not identical. Oh, that's easy. The first one, the one that's actually recorded at the time. The other one is in the middle of a big speech and he's doing it from Who memory. Who recorded it? Uh, um, well, if, if you believe that Moses uh, wrote the books of Moses... And he's been quite a few years afterwards. So I think the 
the creation story probably was handed down by word of mouth. Well, but wait a minute. You asked which commandment was the original. And well, the original that's what I'm commandment saying. is written down um, at the time it's given, and then you're using the, a later speech that has several differences. And you can tell he's quoting it by memory because there's a little word and that got slipped in one place and it gets taken out another place and the wife and the, and the house get swapped and, uh, and, the, and the fifth commandment has some little additions and if you apply form criticism to those you will find that the exodus is the original. It's clear. Aren't you kind of splitting hairs a little bit on Aren't that? Aren't you kind of splitting hairs to begin with? No, I'm not, because no. it says, look at, look at the, read it for yourself. Everybody go and read it for yourself. And then read look at the, the video. Read the fourth commandment. No, no, they and didn't have a video And then look at the video, because then. they go into detail in the Hebrew as to what the differences are. I think you, you don't can care go, about the Hebrew. You can, I think you can go through and justify anything you want, and you can come up with your own reason. But, but right now, looking at the output, the Bibles we have now, it, one of them talks about creation, and the other one talks about being set free from the Egyptians, the Hebrews. The other problem that you have, and this is a really serious problem, is that Exodus 20 is not the only place where it talks about God and uh, where it talks about God creating the world in six days and the Sabbath is connected with that. There's also a reference later on in Exodus. So even if you were to get rid of the fourth commandment, even if you were to get rid of the creation part of the fourth commandment, you're still stuck with that. You're stuck with the later reference in Exodus. Well, you see, Deuteronomy doesn't say, but God didn't really create in six days, does it? It doesn't say God created, it doesn't say God didn't create in six days. It is not a negative. It is giving a different reason, and if you want to, you can kind of say, you could say that both of them were true, couldn't you? I do believe they're both true. Okay. But I'm saying they're true because of application. The Sabbath is being applied to two different things. The Sabbath is being applied to two different things, but if the one is true, it doesn't matter whether the other is true or not, you're still stuck with the truth that the Sabbath was pointing to six-day creation, and you're stuck with it because of the other text. <laughs> See, here's the thing, and this is really important. Uh, Adventists and other, uh, and other, uh, other conservative Christians have oftentimes tried to kind of footsie through this by saying, well, it isn't really intended to be literal. You know, I find it more honest if you're going to go that route to just go the James Barr route and say, look, I don't believe this stuff, but they intended it to be literal. I find that would be way more honest than to say, well, they didn't really mean what they said. But my criticism is not being literal or, or whatever. My criticism is using the Ten Commandments as the absolute Look, there is no absolute proof of anything, right? Okay, but it is a, but it, I mean, in science we don't have absolute proof, and if you want to, you don't have to believe the Bible. You don't. And you can always take and try desperately, but you see, what I'm saying is that our job is not to try to find out whether the Bible can agree with our ideas. Our job is to try to understand what the Bible has to say. And that's what I'm doing. Uh, but that's not what you're doing. That is what I'm doing. <laughs> I disagree with you. <laughs> uh, uh, comment here, 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 and there. Yeah, the, the discussion between the Ten Commandments and Exodus and Deuteronomy has been going on for years and years. And I have to uh, say sometimes I, I wonder why there is such a discussion 
uh, because these are two different things entirely. The authors are different. In Deuteronomy, it's Moses talking to the people, and he has a lot of extra comments in there that he throws in. Uh, in Exodus, it's God speaking. And I consider God more authoritative than Moses. Uh, and I, to me, that this more or less settles the question. Yeah, unless you want to go the route of saying that, that God actually didn't say that. I, I think that's, and that to me, if you're, if you're going that route, that's kind of, uh, well, it's risky theological. Well, why, why are you going to believe anything else in the Bible if you're going to go that route? Exactly. Let's just say the Bible isn't normative then. Go ahead and then. Well, well, uh, I think this is absolutely absurd myself. I'm just a couple of days off of chemo, so it's not a good time for me to really get into this discussion. But the uh, Genesis account and the Deuteronomy account uh, make perfectly good sense. They don't contradict each other. This exactly, they one, both can yeah, be. Yeah, and the second one, which God is this? This is the God who created in the first account. And he did some marvelous uh, uh, miracles that you can't explain in any other normal way uh, except when Christ comes uh, several thousand years later uh, and spoke and created miracles. He turned uh, Moses' rod into a snake, living snake. He brought lots of plagues. None of us are capable of doing anything like that. And he says that I not only created the world, but I rescued you as God. I was the only one who had the power to get you out of your situation. And trying to make these stupid uh, differences like this, well, I said I was just off chemo, is absolutely absurd. Use your heads. Comment there? Yes. At the beginning of your presentation, you made reference to the discussion whether uh, verse 1 and 2 uh, is referring to a different event. In the beginning, now we, we believe that the universe existed for billions of years. So I'm inclined to accept the notion that it's probably re referring to two events, and that's the first creative act recorded in Genesis 1 is when God says, let there be light. Now, my question is, using what God wrote with his own finger, in Exodus 20, can this interpretation be supported by that text or not? In other words, can, can we possibly use Exodus 20 to interpret Genesis 1 as two events? One, at the beginning of the universe, when God created the universe, and then when he created life on earth. Verse 3 through 31. Come back next week and we'll discuss that. I know, but <laughs> I may not be able to be here next week. Well, then you'll have to look at it on the video. <laughs> Can you say at least two words? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, let, let's, let's put it this way. Uh, there, is, uh, there is a reasonable way to have a creation at the beginning and then a seven-day creation uh, uh, with time sometime later. And, uh, and you'll have to, if you want to hear the argument for that, you'll have to, to watch it or read it, or read the book for that matter. Uh, to come back to the point that I was making earlier, this is uh, Exodus 31, 17. 
It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever, speaking of the Sabbath. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and the, on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So that even if one were to get Exodus 20, 11 off the playing field, you're going to have to do the same thing for Exodus 31, 17. Right? My turn? Yes. <laughs> okay. um, I spoke of doing my doctoral dissertation, Andrews. I don't want to repeat that. But at one point, I was interviewing Henry M. Morris to do a dissertation on him and one other creationist to show the connections between Adventism and non-Adventism in young earth creationism. My so you were in early Ronald Numbers. <laughs> <laughs> but totally opposite, of course, in conclusions. Anyway, um, when I read Henry Morris, I've read almost everything he's written. He's, he puts uh, Exodus 20 at a much higher level of inspiration. Uh, some of our evangelical friends have levels of inspiration. Uh, Ellen Where have White, I heard that before? Ellen White uh, cautions against uh, degrees of inspiration. And that was a big debate in early Adventism. Um, he said that Exodus 20 is not only inspired, but it's inscribed by God. Inspired and inscribed. And the inscription makes it much more tr trustworthy than inspired. And Henry Morris has carried the day. I have the Creation Research Society quarterly, and the, the quote is on the front, Hec uh, Credimus, mm -hmm. and it quotes from the Fourth Commandment. And uh, this is the basis for the modern creation movement is Exodus 20. So the discussion we're having here is very, very critical. Now, I want to differ with my two of my esteemed colleagues here about Deuteronomy 5 being Moses' words and Moses' interpretation. That could be viewed that way, except when I take it quite literally, when Moses says, the Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. That's verse 2 of Deuteronomy 5. And it goes on to say, uh, the Lord spoke with you face to face at the mountains. So there's speech of the Lord. And then verse 5, he said, and then the next uh, 15 verses are quotes of the Lord speaking. RSV puts quotation marks there. A lot of versions don't. And uh, it appears that Moses is conveying that the Lord spoke this. These are the words of the Lord. Therefore, scholars have to come up with some way of harmonizing the two accounts. And we could probably spend a whole time, I would suggest, let's spend another uh, Sabbath on this topic. It's really important. Okay. Um. And yet, there is nothing in the Bible that is more freely interpreted than the Sabbath. It is um, to f remember that you were free, to remember that uh, Ezekiel has the, the relation between human and yeah. God. And then you get to uh, Hebrews, and the Sabbath is the symbol of eternal rest. So the Sabbath has its symbolic aspects. Yeah. But it is, in Exodus 20, the real thing. And, and Exodus 31. And don't forget, it's not just Exodus 20. Yeah, there's a tiny, tiny variation there, but it's not much. Yeah. And, and this, is, this is the important thing, I think. Is, see, what's happening is people, and, and not necessarily those of you who are speaking, because some of you have heard this from other people who they have an agenda. And the agenda is influencing the biblical interpretation. And the agenda is saying, look, uh, we've got to have some way to account for long ages with slow development. And so uh, 
we will find ways of getting around the difficult text. And the problem is that just like, um, if I can say this, Jehovah's Witnesses have sometimes been known to uh, use uh, different translations, shall we say, uh, it's hard to go through the whole Bible and eliminate them all. And that's one of the nice things about the, the way the Bible read, uh, says things in several different ways is that, eventually, that if, if you, you, have to, you have to basically ignore the whole thing in order to get to where some of these people want to go. And, and so it's, it's really important for us you know, let's read it, let's try to understand it, and then if the end, at the end of the day we don't want to believe it, let's just stand up and say, well, we don't believe it all. I think that's better than trying to say, well, it didn't really mean. And that's the point he's making is, it did really mean. It you don't have to believe it, but if you're going to take the Bible as authoritative, then you're stuck with it. If you're not going to take the Bible as authoritative, why are we having this discussion anyway? Because you're going to believe what you want to believe and forget the Bible. Uh, just, uh, I would like to add to what she was saying that the most important thing to me about the, the Sabbath is its significance to rest. Uh, and in the creation, God rested. In the Exodus, uh, there was rest from work in Egypt. And... Uh, in, uh, the, in Hebrews 11, which she was referring to, and I really believe that Seventh-day Adventists are missing out on this as not presenting uh, Christ as the Sabbath rest as we see in Hebrews 11. I really think that we would attract more of other religions uh, if we could focus on that. Uh, that it's not, just, it's not a day that saves you. It's Christ, the rest, who saves you. And this is what the Sabbath is symbolizing and has uh, through, it symbolizes rest through all of these. I agree with that. Um, yeah, I have another question. When the Bible says that God created the heavens and the earth, the word heavens, is this a reference to the entire universe or our atmosphere. Now, if you Come say... Come back next week. <laughs> next week. Next week. <laughs> no, I'm serious. The reason that I'm doing this this slowly is because it's difficult enough to get through one subject and do it right. Yeah. Uh, if you try to do three or four of them, you're zooming past all the evidence. And, and one of the things I'm trying to do with this, and I don't know whether I'm succeeding or not, is not just give you what Davidson believes or even what I believe, but rather give you the, the background, the behind the scenes, the evidence for it. You know, the Hebrew behind it, the grammatical stuff, the, uh, the, uh, the comments from the rest of the Bible. And that's why we're not trying to, you know, we're going through it a piece at a time. And, and you can't make me stay here for two hours. Well, I don't want you to do that. But since I may not be here, can I finish my question? Yes, you because can. Because you didn't let me. Uh, but I'm not, uh, not going to necessarily answer Okay, it. okay. My question is based on the following fact. I like to accept the literal reading of Genesis 1. I'm enamored with that idea. Because since I was a little boy, I was trained that way. It's hard when you are 84 to just depart from that. But, so, I'm also enamored with the idea that the universe is old and there are two events, but the pro my problem is creation of the stars in day five, I believe. Four. Four. That yeah. forces me to... An, a problem that has no solution. Oh, come back next week. Well, uh, we will discuss that. We will take your question under advisement. Um, we've got a couple of questions in the back here, and uh, 
and uh, maybe that maybe we'll let that close it. Uh. Yeah. Uh, whoa, that's loud. <laughs> the uh, there, there's two quick uh, comments or statements. One of them, I think that you're going to go. I'm not an expert on this, but I think you're going to go into Hugh Ross and some of his stuff next week. And the thing is, is that he keeps changing a bit, but he he's trying to argue from the standpoint of being a Christian. But to push back on the second point even further, is it because they in the public schools they don't even want us to have intelligent design, so that just gets away with everything. So, do you want to push back and try to? fiddle around in the Bible, or do you want to just throw out the whole business? Well, it's kind of interesting that uh, Hugh Ross's compromise isn't acceptable to the... Oh, back there, yeah. Hugh Ross's compromise is not acceptable to uh, the scientific community. In a certain important way, Hugh Ross is partly on our side. Uh, that, yes, that there is a creator and that he made specific creative acts and that you can tell that he made specific creative uh, acts and that is heresy. And the thing of it is, even if you do Michael Behe and you accept common descent and you accept, if you think that, that God did something and that you can tell that he did something, you have now crossed into our territory, if you like. And, and it's something that we need to be really, really careful about. Um, I, even though I disagree with Hugh Ross on a number of things, I don't like shooting me in the back. I think that it's important for us, A, to recognize both the differences but also the similarities. Um, I think that my position is more defensible than his uh, theologically. And I think it's starting to be more defensible scientifically. But I don't view Hugh Ross as a, as a mean person who must be put down. He is trying to solve a difficult problem. His solutions are different from mine. Um, I think that in some ways they're inferior, but that doesn't mean that I should call him a bad person because of it. Or even that we can't cooperate together on certain issues where we do seem closer to eye to eye. Looks like our friend will have to be here next week anyway, but I wish I could be, but I can't. Well, it will be out on the internet, and if everything else fails, you can't actually buy the book. Uh, last well, comment refer in the back. Referring to what you just said, um, you say that the, uh, world, well, is, the Bible is very logical. People aren't. If you say that uh, God created the entire universe on the fourth day, but it took him seven days to create the earth, isn't there something a little strange about that? Well, like um, I say, come back yeah. next week. <laughs> yeah. And if you take a commandment and say Sabbath is symbolic, but you can says don't kill, that's not symbolic, that's ridiculous. Um, and I, we're going to... And if we go with um, Aristotle, we're going to have the longest Sabbath day and the longest sermon we've ever heard because we're going to be here for a thousand years today. We won't even live that long. Okay, well, hopefully we'll see you next week. <laughs>